I invite you now to open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus chapter 5. As we continue this theme on our deliverer, God as a deliverer, uh, I think Nathan said it last week in his sermon, this is probably the greatest story of delivery is that of, of with Moses and the Israelites. And so we're going to eventually work our way to that, but we find ourselves right now kind of at the start with Exodus chapter 5. Now if we can, we're going to, I've got a little bit of time, so we're going to go through Exodus chapter 1 through chapter 5 briefly, I promise. But let's just kind of remember what's taking place. If you look, if you want to follow along, you can. But in Exodus chapter 1, we find the Israelites being made slaves. The new leader has come up, and he doesn't care any longer what Joseph has to say or what God has to say through Joseph. And so he decides to take the Israelites captive, and he makes them slaves. And in Exodus chapter 1, verse 14, we find that they are given harsh labor. They are to make bricks and mortar. And so we find this happening in Exodus chapter 1. In Exodus chapter 2, we find the birth of Moses. And we remember that story in Sunday school, do we not? And the reality is, is Moses grows up pretty quick, doesn't he? In 11 verses, to, 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 be, on, to be exact, in 11 verses, Moses, it says in verse 11, he's all grown up now in chapter 2. Time flies. And we then see right after that as well in Exodus chapter 2, the familiar story of of Moses killing the Egyptian, and then all of a sudden we find him fleeing. In Exodus chapter 3, we find that familiar story of Moses and the burning bush, God giving the call to Moses. In verse 8, God says that he's going to rescue, that he's going to deliver his people from slavery. In verse 10, God tells Moses that he's sending him to Pharaoh, that Moses is the man, he's going to send him to Pharaoh. In, verse, or in chapter 3 as well of Exodus, we find that Moses is not very convinced that he's the right guy for the job. And we find God telling him, Moses, I will be with you. Isn't it wonderful that God just desires to be with us? And this passage of Scripture quickly comes to mind that we can do all things through Christ who's with us, who strengthens us. And God tells Moses in Exodus 3, I will be with you. But that still wasn't enough for Moses, was it? And so all of a sudden in Exodus chapter 4, we see God's mighty hand. We see the signs. We see the wonders that God performs. First of all, he tells Moses, throw down your staff. And Moses throws it down, and all of a sudden it becomes a snake. Pretty powerful, huh? He tells him to pick it up, which at that point I would say, are you kidding me, God? Because if you remember, I do not like snakes. But he picks the snake up, and it becomes a staff again. Moses, still not fully convinced, God says, I'll show you another sign. Put your hand in the pocket of your cloak. And so Moses does that, and as he takes it out, his hand looks as if he has leprosy. He says, do it again. He does it again, and he pulls it out, and it's perfect again. As if that wasn't enough, God said, listen, I'll show you another sign. Take water from the Nile, and you pour it on dry ground, and when you do that, it will become blood on the ground. You know something? We serve a mighty God, don't we? We serve a God who can really do anything. And, and, and we learn that very early on in Sunday school. Remember the Sunday school course? Sing with me. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. Nothing my God cannot do. You remember that. All right, you even got the clap. All right, Kathy, good. There's nothing our God cannot do. And all of a sudden we see this displayed just through a few wonders right here, through a few signs in Exodus 4. But then we get to Exodus 5. (laughs) We get to Exodus 5. Where all of a sudden now Moses is following through and he says, God says, I will speak for you. And he tells Moses to go back to Egypt and he does that and he gets Aaron and and all of a sudden they gather the people, they perform the signs, they're amazed, they worship, they do this. And so all of a sudden now Moses is going to Pharaoh and that's where we are in in, in chapter five. 
And so Moses goes, and he goes with God, knowing that God is with him. But then all of a sudden, when he gets to Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, I ain't doing that. There's no way I'm going to let your people go. What are you talking about? As a matter of fact, I think you guys are just a bunch of lazy people, is what he says. You're just trying to get out of work, worship the Lord. Yeah, right. You just want to get out of work. He says, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Not only am I going to make you make the same number of bricks, I'm going to go make you gather all the hay for the bricks as well. Now, one of the things you've got to understand is that in those days, they would use the hay uh, to, to make it go into the mud, into the clay. It would make the bricks stronger. So that was an important part to do. But to gather the hay took some time. And that was already given to them because they were already having to do a lot in making all the bricks for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians. And so all of a sudden now, Moses has done what God has told him to do. He's, he's, he's done exactly, and things don't get better. They actually get worse. They actually get worse. But God, you're so big, so strong, so mighty. There's nothing you can't do. What happens, though, what happens when all of a sudden we trust God, when all of a sudden we as believers put our faith in God, when all of a sudden we pray to God, just as Moses did, and God doesn't deliver right away? What happens when answers to our prayer don't come in the form that we want them to? What happens when we get a different answer than we expect? What happens when we pray, and instead of things getting better, they get worse? What happens when deliverance is delayed? This morning, that's what I want us to look at and what I want us to think about. Because as we see right here in our, our, our key verses are, are those last two, verses 22 and 23, Moses returned to the Lord after he'd gone to Pharaoh, after he had done exactly what he was told to do, he goes to Pharaoh and he says, or goes to the Lord and says, why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Is this why you called me? Is this why you told me to do these things? God, I've been listening to you. I trusted you. Is this why I'm going Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, it's gotten worse, God. He's brought trouble on his people, and you have not delivered us. You haven't delivered us. In this scripture this morning, Moses is pleading with God because he's done everything that's been asked. And he's almost as saying, I've kept my end of the bargain why haven't you shown up yet? You know, I can almost hear the same type of questions asked by all different types of people throughout the Bible. Job comes to mind. David. How about the New Testament? Mary, Martha, as Lazarus dies. Jesus, why weren't you here? It's over. It's too late. What's happening? Why didn't you show up. You know, there are times in our lives that things appear to be just like that for us, do they not? Things look like they're over. It appears that we've been defeated. It appears as if God has actually turned his back on us, maybe. It looks as if God might have forgotten us. We feel like it might be too late for God to do anything concerning the situation that we find ourselves in. Can I just say this? The storms of life come to everyone, to each and every one of us. As believers, we are not eliminated from the storms. We will go through storms in life. The storms will come to each and every one of us, and, and sometimes God delivers us. Sometimes God calms the storm, and other times he gets in the boat with us and he calms his children. Deliverance might be delayed right now, but what are we to do then? We are to wait upon the Lord. We are to trust God when deliverance is delayed. In Atlanta right now, there is a countdown going on. 
I think it's around 40-something days. And what I'm talking about is the second-year cadets in Atlanta, Georgia, are counting down the days until commissioning. And the reason I know that is because I see it on Facebook. I'm, I'm talked to by some of the cadets, and they just can't wait. Because in 40-some days, they will be commissioned as a lieutenant. In 40-some days, they will be given their appointment. They know where they're going to go. In 40-some days, they are out of the training college, which is what they're really excited about. Now, i got to tell you something. That's, that, that countdown is nothing new. That's been going on for a long time. And I can remember uh, back in 2003, that countdown was going down for Shelly and I. And the countdown usually starts in January because it's as if you're kind of on your downhill there and you're getting ready to find out where you're going to go. You're, you're just excited. Commissioning is coming. All the festivities are happening. And so that countdown was a reality for Shelly and I 10 years ago. And in doing that, i got to be honest with you, there's a few things that happen in our countdown. First of all, something was in the middle of our countdown. Emma was to be born in April of that year. And so we had the countdown for commissioning as well as the countdown for Emma. And we couldn't wait. We had everything planned out. We had it timed out perfectly. Or so we thought. You know, that countdown, in a way, turned into a big problem because Emma, first of all, came early. But that's not a problem. That's actually good. She was a premature baby, and so that was fine. She was healthy as could be. Came in March instead of April, March the 21st. And we were blessed with Emma. And what that meant was, I guess, the countdown for, for commissioning could just come sooner. And it was all right. We were ready. But in the month of May, we found ourselves in the hospital. We found ourselves in a hospital with a little baby, our little baby, who the doctors were telling us she has viral meningitis. We couldn't believe it. We were devastated. And all of a sudden, the countdown was no more. We could care less about that. You see, within the countdown, we just couldn't wait. We couldn't wait for commissioning. We couldn't wait to get out on our own. We couldn't wait for those things. And now all of a sudden, we found ourselves in a waiting room. A waiting room. Waiting for doctors. Waiting for diagnosis. Waiting for what's going to happen. We were scared to death. I found myself just saying, why, God? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Now, you all know the rest of the story. Emma's here with us, and she's okay. But let me tell you, let me fill in some of the blanks for you. That year, uh, we were doing a musical, as cadets usually do, so get ready, Ryan and everyone else. Antoine, you're going to be in a musical. We did a musical on, jo uh, on uh, who was it on? Joshua. <laughs> it was on Joshua. And I, I was to be Joshua. And so they wouldn't let me miss practices, so I had to go back and forth from the hospital to be there and, and to do those kind of things. And Shelly was able to stay with Emma, of course, and she missed the musical. The musical was on Saturday night. Emma was still in the hospital, and she was released Saturday afternoon. And I can remember as Joshua, I had a solo, but that solo, I sang it as Joshua, and it simply said this, on this day, God, the victory you have won. Now, that victory, of course, was talking about the Battle of Jericho, as the musical goes. But let me tell you something, that on that day, God, the victory you have won meant something brand new to me as Emma was released from the hospital. You see, I came into a much greater understanding of who God is in that waiting period. I came into a greater understanding of being more dependent upon him and not upon myself. For you see, there was nothing I could do for Emma except for wait and trust God. Examples like that happen all the time, do they not? The reality is they don't always end the same way. A waiting upon the Lord could mean a greater healing. <laughs> 
waiting upon the Lord can mean something different because once again, it's his way that's best, not our way. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the trials which you will have and which try you. But rejoice inasmuch as that we are partakers in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, when his victory shall be won on this day, God, the victory you have won, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Sue Kidd tells a story that that reflects on our often mistaken viewpoint of waiting. She says this, during a retreat at a monastery, in her restless state, she noticed a monk. He was sitting perfectly still beneath a tree, and there was such reverence in his silhouette, such tranquil sturdiness that I paused to watch. He was the picture of waiting, Sue said. Later, she says, I sought him out, and she told him, I saw you today sitting beneath, sitting beneath the tree, just sitting there so still. How is it that you can wait so patiently in the moment? I can't seem to get used to the idea of doing nothing, she says. The monk then broke into a wonderful grin, and he said, well, there's the problem right there, young lady. You've bought into the cultural myth that when you're waiting, you're doing nothing. Then he took his hands, and he placed them on her shoulders, and he looked her right in the eye and says, I need you to listen to me right now. When you're waiting, he says, you're not doing nothing. You're doing the most important something there is. You're allowing your soul to grow. If you can't be still and wait, you can't become what God created you to be. Can I just say this, that when we find ourselves in the midst of problems, trials, our job is to wait on the Lord and to trust Him. Moses in in verses 22 and 23 was pleading with God, and then we see God's response in chapter 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. God desires to show us what he is going to do. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, says Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Delivery is coming. Deliverance is coming. It's the greatest story of deliverance probably found, minus that of Jesus, in the Bible. And what God is saying is, I know what I'm doing. Be patient. Wait. And in the midst of the waiting, I'm going to show you things. I'm going to teach you things. I'm going to grow you in ways that I think you need to be grown. And so today we find ourselves maybe in one of those spots where we don't know what quite is to come, but we do know who's in charge. We sung the song earlier, I'm in His Hands, which is one of my favorite songs you will notice it's on the programs pretty regularly because it's one of my favorites. Recently, um, Phil Lager has taken the, um, Phil Lager has taken the words to the course and he's redone the tune. And in doing so, he's had to change the words around just a little bit, not much, but just a little bit. I think it's worth mentioning It says, I'm in his hands, I'm in his hands. Whatever the future holds, I'm in his hands. Ways I cannot see, his ways I cannot see has all been planned for me. And then he says this, his way is best. Now in Commissioner Dittmer's, there's a comma there. And usually that means the pause, right? 
His way is best. And then he goes on, you see, I'm in his hands. See, many times when I sing that song, his way is best, you see, we just kind of go on. His way is best. Comma, pause, wait, (laughs) understand that. You see, I'm in his hands. And that's each and every one of us. And so right now, Antoine's just going to sing that chorus through a few times for us. And as we do, I invite us just to pray. Wherever you might find yourselves, you might find yourselves in a little bit of need. You might find yourselves in trial and you're asking God, deliver me from this fear, from this addiction, from this whatever it is, from this problem I find myself in. Or you might be finding yourself like Moses saying, why aren't you, God, doing this? I've done everything, and it just seems to be getting worse. (laughs) God's saying, just wait on me. Trust me. You might not be able to see that, but I'm going to deliver you because I'm almighty, I'm powerful, and I know what I'm doing. Can we just spend this time in prayer? The altar's open. Holiness table's open. Let me invite you to come forward. Let's pray together. Let's just take this time right now to be still and to know he's God. Let's pray. Verse 6, once again, it says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And God is saying to us, I will bring you out from that slavery, whatever it is that you find yourself in, I can do that. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with outstretched arms. Does that sound familiar? That's what Jesus did for us. With outstretched arms, he redeemed, he delivered each and every one of us. So that no longer are we to be slaves, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's liberty. There's deliverance. I will redeem you with outstretched arms and with mighty acts of judgment. May we just patiently wait upon the Lord because His way is best. And may we continue to trust him wherever we find ourselves in. Father, right now we just pray. We pray that you just help us to continue to recognize who you are. You are God Almighty. You are powerful. You are the I Am. You are in control. And because of that, we can easily say that you are our deliverer. But, Father, in the midst of trial, in the midst of trouble, in the midst, Father, when we don't see deliverance, may we still recognize that that's who you are, and may we patiently wait upon you. And as we wait, may we be silent and let you be God. May we be people who have great hope that you're going to do something, 
and you're going to do the right thing. And may we be people who are attentive, who are watching and waiting on you. Your way is best. And Father, we thank you so much that we're in your hands. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.